Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is Pulitzer winning biographer John Meacham who's also an executive vice president at Random House. I've been rereading your wonderful book, Franklin and Winston. Tell us about their very special friendship, this friendship between Roosevelt and Churchill. Well, it was unparalleled in modern times. They spent 113 days together during the war. They exchanged nearly 2,000 letters. They spent Thanksgiving together, Christmas together, their wedding anniversaries together. They fished and they drank and they smoked and they decided <laughs> the fate of the world. And it was a case of the personal affecting the political mm -hmm. in a really fundamental way that I think is the real story of history as opposed to broader generic impersonal forces doing it. If there hadn't been a war how likely is it that they would have become friends? Uh, not, not. They were brought together by the force of circumstance. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said we picture lovers face to face but friends side by side. Hmm. Their eyes look ahead. Hmm and they were totally joined by a common cause. And when you think about it, most friendships are. Think about the synonyms we use for friendship. Roommate, teammate, mm -hmm. neighbor. These are colleague. These are all terms that suggest a common context as well as a personal connection. So I don't think that's extraordinary at all. In what ways did they complement each other? Well, Churchill was more open, uh, warmer, needier. Uh, Roosevelt was a very cool customer. Uh, Churchill actually saw this in terms of courtship. He said that mm -hmm. no lover ever studied the whims of his mistress as I mm -hmm. did those of Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt was cannier. He mm -hmm. was a better politician. Uh, won four presidential elections in the most complicated country uh, of any democracy. Churchill was a more erratic politician. Uh, very nearly didn't become Prime Minister, didn't become Prime Minister mm -hmm. until he was 65. He'd been in Parliament for 41 years beforehand. And so I think that basically you had Churchill who was a rock against mm -hmm. Hitler in 39, 40, 41. Mm -hmm. And you had Roosevelt who was a much more manipulative and shrewd figure who managed American public opinion until it was time to uh, actually join the battle. And Roosevelt was slow to warm to Churchill. Yes, they well, they both were in a way. They were uh, Churchill met. They met in July 1918, at the end of the First World War, and Churchill forgot it. And <laughs> Roosevelt thought he was a stinker, as he put it. He was, he was <laughs> lording it all over us, because at that point, Rose, uh, Churchill was a much senior figure. Uh, and at that point, FDR was the Assistant Secretary mm -hmm. of the Navy. He was uh, quite vain. He, it was, this was pre-polio, so he had mm -hmm. not been tested in the way that he was and become, became the man he became. And so they were, uh, whether they would have been chums if they'd simply met at a country house, I don't know. But they didn't, so. Was there a definitive moment that established the friendship? I think it was August 1941 aboard the HMS Prince of Wales. It was a church parade, as the British Navy <laughs> called it. And this is before Pearl Harbor. Churchill is def desperately trying to find a way to engage Roosevelt's imagination and heart and ultimately his muscle and America's muscle in the war. And the best thing he could hit on was the language of faith <laughs> and the great Anglo-Saxon hymns, the great Anglo-Saxon lessons. And he picked Onward Christian Soldiers, Eternal Father Strong mm -hmm. to Save, and O oh God Our Help in Ages Past. And as they left, uh, Roosevelt said to his son, with no expectation that it would be repeated, it's a private remark, he said, Onward Christian Soldiers, we are Christian soldiers, and we will go on with God's help. If nothing else had brought us together, that would have done it. Hmm, that's beautifully said, isn't it? What a wonderful line. I'm glad it got out and they were able to, re to repeat it. Do you think that these two very different men empowered each other? Yes, I do. I think that, again, without Churchill, it's almost unimaginable how far Hitler would have gotten. Without Roosevelt marshalling the political opinion and the strength of the country, ultimately the Allies would have only had a stalemate, I think, mm -hmm. as opposed to victory. And so I think that one was the one was the brawn emotionally and one was the brawn 
physically. In your book, American Gospel, you talked about the impact of religion on the development of this country. I'm particularly interested in the role religion plays during critical times like World War II. How did religion influence the decisions that FDR made, for example? Well, it was more a cultural context. Mm -hmm. It was they wanted to defend a way of life that had an inescapable connection to a tradition of religious liberty and ultimately religious faith in many ways. Uh, Church uh, Roosevelt actually said in his D-Day prayer, the only thing FDR said in public on D-Day, June 6, 1944, was he read a prayer of his own composition. And he talked about how they were in a struggle for our civilization, our religion, our way of life. And so while they did not explicitly see themselves acting in, in a, a theological cause, they were in fact attempting to defend an ethos and a culture that had been supported by and supported mm. uh, religious liberty. You edited a wonderful collection of essays about Shelby Foote called American Homer. In what ways has Shelby Foote influenced you as a writer? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I think he was one of the unacknowledged founders of the new journalism, the idea that mm -hmm. you could bring novelistic and narrative techniques to nonfiction. Foote was a novelist, and he came to history sort of by accident and it was one of the more cataclysmic accidents <laughs> in literary history that he had to, that he then uh, stayed with it for a million and a half words. Mm. Uh, I think that my view of, of, of historical writing is that if you go very long in a book or a piece even without something that could be dramatized on stage mm -hmm. or on mm -hmm. screen, then you're asking a reader to commit at a different level than pure narrative. If you, if, if mm -hmm. does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, and Foote was all about a kind of cinematic, uh, dramatic instinct in historical writing. And I think uh, that certainly William Manchester was like that, James McGregor Burns was like that, Arthur Schlesinger was mm -hmm. like that, and I think that Without that sensibility, I would write very different kinds of books. Well, in the preface to this collection, you quote Emerson, who said, there is no history, only biography. Right. Is that your mantra as a writer? Yes, it is. Because I think that people make it. Uh, geography matters, weather matters, uh, economics matter. But all in all, uh, you, I think those are sort of the, at least geography and climate are the stakes which you grant, <laughs> and then the people make the difference. Uh, my favorite example of this is how would the world have turned out if Roosevelt and Churchill had both died mm -hmm. in the early 1930s? Mm -hmm. Both of, Churchill was nearly run, was run down in the street in New York by a car and almost died. FDR was almost shot in December of 1932. I think it would have been a different world at the end of the 1930s and early 1940s without them. And that's not just because I didn't want to write a book called Clement and Wendell. <laughs> uh, wouldn't have been the same, yeah, no. It wouldn't have been the same. You won the Pulitzer Prize for your biography of Andrew Jackson, American Lion. In what ways did he personify his era? He was self-made, energetic, uneven, uh, morally ambiguous, strong, and absolutely devoted to the idea that the basic political conversation had to include the broad populace mm -hmm. of white men, but broader than the initial generation of the founders had, had really contemplated or anticipated. It's uh, one of the great uh, lines about democracy during the Constitutional Convention, the founding, was that democracy was a bad word. You, know, you did not mm -hmm. want, that, that's what they were trying to stop mm -hmm. uh, with the checks and balances. Jackson saw two things. One was that the broad populace had to be part of it, and the other was that the presidency was a central and inescapably significant conduit for the will of the people. It was not simply a 
coordinate branch of government in the, in the technical term. It was, as, ja as Jackson put it, the president was the direct, the only direct representative of the American people. And what? so he, he was building an imperial presidency on behalf of the many. What are some of the most common misconceptions about Jackson? I think that he was a total rube. Uh, <laughs> he used his frontier manner and background to great effect. I think he was an incredibly sophisticated politician, not simply a man of temper and passion. He, the best story about this is during the bank battle over the Bank of the United States, mm -hmm. a group came to him requesting some relief, some bankers, and Jackson goes crazy, starts spitting and spewing and says, you know, go, you know, <laughs> if you don't die, this is not the place to go, go see Nicholas Biddle. <laughs> and they all scurry out. And just as the door closes, Jackson turns to an aide and says, didn't I manage them well? <laughs> so he knew what he was doing. He had an intense theatrical sense. And I think that insofar as people engage with Jackson at all, it's on two levels. One is the terrible, tragic issue of Indian removal. The mm -hmm. other is he was a madman mm -hmm. who was simply a demagogue. Mm -hmm. He was the architect of a, one of the two, one, one of the twin tragedies of American history, Indian removal. There's no question mm -hmm. about it. My view of this is that while Jackson was complicit and guilty of that, he was on the extreme edge of the mainstream, but he was still within the mainstream of American life and thought at that time. And so, as, as Arthur Schlesinger used to say, self-righteousness in retrospect is easy. I think that mm -hmm. we have to see that in, in context and learn from it. The other is this idea that he was, again, sort of this demagogic figure. Uh, he demagogued what he wanted to demagogue mm -hmm. and could pick and choose his battles. Was there a time in your research when you suddenly felt like you knew him on a deeper level? Yes, that's an interesting question. I, I thought that I couldn't figure out why he had taken the position he had on nullification. Mm -hmm. In 1832, 33, South Carolina's setting up a precursor really to the Civil War, the idea that a state could decide to nullify, opt out of whatever the federal law was. It was a, the beginning of uh, the attempt to build a predicate that if slavery were ever abolished, a state could say, no, we'll keep it. Everything about Jackson would have suggested that he would have approved of that level of states' rights. He was a Jeffersonian Republican. He was a figure who uh, very much believed that the federal government should stay out of things unless he decided they should get in them, mm -hmm. uh, which is a common view of federalism. So I was trying, but, he, but he reacted incredibly vociferously against this move toward a more powerful states' rights position. And in trying to figure out why, it was more than the fact that he wanted to shoot John Calhoun. That was one of them. <laughs> uh, and what I settled on was that he had lost his brothers and his mother before during the American Revolution, before he was 14, and that he saw the country, as he once put it, as one great family. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the Union, which had been consecrated to some extent by their blood and their sacrifice, would then be broken up was something that was simply an anthema to him. He, mm -hmm. couldn't, he couldn't see that. And he was determined to preserve the Union at all costs. And I, I honestly believe that that was an emotional reaction to the way he, the very chaotic and bloody way in which he'd grown up. What still puzzles you about him? I think the, I think it goes back to the Native American question. I think that he had the capacity to understand the moral implications of what he was doing. And he just was so determined to get the land to create what he thought of as a national security uh, context that I think it's one of the great 
again, with slavery, one of the mm -hmm. great failings. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't as though there weren't contrary voices. Mm -hmm. You know, there were people making a moral case about it, and he was fully capable of understanding that moral reasoning. How did you first learn that you won the Pulitzer Prize? <laughs> I was in Sewanee, Tennessee, where mm -hmm. I went to school uh -huh. uh, at a board meeting, I think. And I, to use a technical term, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> I, had, I had no idea. And so the phone rang, uh, and it was, um, actually it was Donald Graham, uh, my yes. then boss uh, at the Washington Post Company, who had read it on the wire. That's how they do it. They just uh -huh. put it, they uh -huh. just announce it. They don't tell you. So, uh, so but, it, but it was uh, lovely to be in the place where it all began for me to, to find out. So far we've been talking about history that's had time to settle, that's been evaluated and reevaluated. What was it like when you were editor of Newsweek magazine and covering history in the making? Well, they're, they're intimately connected in many ways because I think that being historically minded cuts two ways. One is you always have some perspective. Uh, well, no, this is just like when William the Conqueror did X. You know, it makes you very annoying. Uh, makes one very annoying. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that it gives you, I think, more sympathy for the characters and the drama that's unfolding in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a partisan point. It depends on the Republican, Democratic president, whatever. You just s understand that these folks are dealing with a panoply of factors, many of which we are not privy to, and that it's much harder than it looks. Mm -hmm. And I think that there should be a measure of, uh, of grace and not deference, mm -hmm. I don't mean that, but a sense of not being quite so quick to offer vitriolic personal attacks against people who I honestly believe, by and large, are in this for wonderful and good reasons. And that sort of non-cynical view uh, is not wildly common. Uh, <laughs> no, no. But, but I, I believe it. And I think that uh, I, the more you learn about the past, the more you see that there are no conspiracy theories. It's all too complicated and haphazard mm -hmm. uh, for that. And that by and large people are doing things because they think they're right. And the, the, the point of the country, the point of the system we have is to disagree, uh, but as Jackson would have it, stay within the same family. You recently left as co-anchor of Need to Know, the public television show. What do you see as the future of public broadcasting? I hope it's bright and strong. I think it's great. Uh, and not just because of Antiques Roadshow. Uh, <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Though, well, it's, it, you know, it keeps the lights on. <laughs> um, I think it's, I have loved PBS, uh, WNET in New York, uh, Channel 13. Everyone's been lovely uh, and smart and dedicated and devoted and just wonderful. You know, there's that Bill Moyers tradition in New York that's just great. Moyers himself has been fabulous to me and, and very generous. And I always go back to a line of, of, of Bill's that the point of public television is not the breadth of its impact, but the depth on a single person. Hmm, that's and, nice. And that's when you slightly remove something from market forces, that's something that's worth the investment. And it's not that much of a public investment in the great scheme of things, and I think I'm delighted it seems, seems that the legislative uh, battles for the year have turned out well. And I, I hope the future is strong and, uh, and bright, I think it will be. That's good to hear. You're an executive vice president at Random House. We mentioned that at the top of the show. There's a lot of concern right now about the book industry. Are books going to survive? What do you think as an insider? Well, I think <laughs> I know less because I'm in. Uh, that's the first thing. I think that books defined as sustained narratives and sustained works of imaginative literature will endure as long as we do. 
Uh, and the issue is, to what extent will people access those narratives in this form uh, of a book, or will they do it on a Kindle or an iPad? My view as a writer and as an editor is, I don't care you know, if you read it as skywriting, you know, just as long as you read it and pay a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, that's not because of greed or we want money, it's just you have to be able to sustain a business and, 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 uh, and pay writers and, uh, and keep uh, that industry going. And what's going to happen, I think, is that there will always be, at least in the, in the sense of always, uh, next quarter century or so, I think that people will, there will be some people who will always want a physical book. I think there will be some people who will only want electronic. I think there will be a plurality of people who will read both. And I think it will depend somewhat on what kind of book. Some people will only read fiction mm -hmm. electronically and buy nonfiction in real terms. The key thing is to tell a great story. And if you tell a great story and you have people who believe that they will be educated and entertained and illuminated by it, then it'll find a business. The great advantage the book business has over journalism is the book folks have never gave, given it away for free. Journalism made a critical mistake mm -hmm. in retrospect mm -hmm. in putting everything out. And so we're finding, broadly as a country, that it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Book publishers don't have to do that. And so that is a comparative advantage that I think, frankly, makes the book world uh, have a certainly a more bright-seeming uh, economic future than, than a lot of journalism. One of the authors that you're bringing to Random House is Al Gore. What mm -hmm. are you going to be working on together? He's working, he's going to write a book on what he calls the drivers of global change. This is beyond climate. Uh, he wants to broaden his gauge beyond uh, what that amazing work he's done, uh, agree or disagree, yeah. uh, on, on climate, to population and demographics, extremism, and really give people a for one-stop shopping on here's what the next hundred years could look like. Mm -hmm. And armed with that information, th then we can begin making decisions about governance and resources. What's it like working with Al Gore? I like, I've always liked the Vice President. Uh, I've gotten to know him much, much better after the presidential campaign. Uh, we're fellow Tennesseans, mm -hmm. uh, where all good people come from. Uh, the good things of the oh, world come from, from Tennessee. Tennessee sure. Coca-Cola, bottling anyway, uh, I, we claim that, uh, <laughs> and moon pies, um, goo goo clusters, very important stuff. Um, he's a lovely man, he's very, very smart. Uh, he would have been a great professor uh, mm -hmm. and has a renaissance intelligence and huge amounts of data up in that head. Uh, and uh, so it's a, um, it'll be a fun process. As an executive vice president, as an editor, how do you find time for your own writing? Uh, I never give up. Uh, <laughs> it's Churchillian. Uh, I write every day, uh, even if it's 200 words, mm -hmm. uh, and just keep after it. Uh, I take great inspiration from Anthony Trollope, you know, who held on a day job and would write on the train going and coming uh, and had a quota. I think he wrote 2,000 words a day or something. And I can't do that, uh, but there's only one trial. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is, I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to do what I do. Uh, this is, these are all, my, my children are healthy, my wife puts up mm -hmm. with me, and I'm, a, I'm allowed to, to do, to think about the kind of things that I find interesting. So I'm just gonna keep my head down. And you're working on a biography of Jefferson. Jefferson, yes, uh, the anti-Jackson uh, <laughs> in many ways. My, my idea is that Jefferson is often seen as this reluctant political warrior, a, a philosopher who was dragged into politics. Well, the person who wanted you to think that was Jefferson. <laughs> and he was an incredible politician. 
you don't get to that job without being one. It just doesn't happen. And I happen, one of my major character weaknesses is I like politicians. <laughs> uh, I think they're fun and interesting and they're the closest thing we've got to Shakespearean characters uh, in, in modern life. And so I want to try to, it's a, it's a big goal, but I want to kind of redeem that, redeem the, the political process. Uh, and if Jefferson had simply gone to Monticello and thought big thoughts, very important and interesting, and people might have read him and all that. But you know, he let's see from about set, from the middle of the 1760s until 1809, he was out of office for about four years. So this was a man who was from the House of Burgesses in Virginia to the Continental Congress to the Confederation Congress to Minister to France, Secretary of State, Vice President, President. For a reluctant warrior, he certainly wasn't a very effective one if he was reluctant, was it? So. <laughs> we just have 30 seconds left, John. I've got to ask you, do you see any overlapping characteristics in these presidents that you write about? They're all frail. They're all uh, prideful. Uh, and I think they all had their hearts in, basically in the right place. And I think that's true of George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and it was true of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And I suspect if we were sitting here a century from now, it would still be true of uh, President Chelsea Clinton and <laughs> whoever else I is. love hearing that. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us, John. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.